<laughs> I'm Wild Mick Brown. You know who I am, except I haven't shaved, so you probably don't Don recognize me. Don the Beard, Dawkins. If you've ever seen our behavior in public, you know, we tend to be extremely mannerly and... Yet humble. Yet, and rhythmical and continental. And so, you know, I, I think Parisian gentlemen would have been good, but then Dokken rhymed with rockin'. In my dreams it's still the same Your love is strong, it still remains As you can plainly see, I am rocking the patented Don Doc and bandana here today, and you know what that means. It is time for yet another mythos. <laughs> Razor, what are you reviewing a hair metal band for? Motherfucker, what hair metal band? Oh, you mean Dokken, the heavy metal band, the hard rock band. What are we predicating all of our empirical assessments of a band's musical quality on their erstwhile fucking fashion sense now? What does that make Devo? Listen, Chief, in case you haven't peeked over the fitted mire of douchey Robin Thick Ponsador hair cuts lately in 2015, each and every goddamn one of us is ultimately a fashion victim. I don't care how zealously you adhere to the core tenets of the gospel according to GQ, you're one grainy black and white high school yearbook photo away from launching your future child into spasmodic guffaws of pants shitting laughter. Sure, Dokken looks like they just got back from an Arsenio Hall estate sale. Sure, the Aquanet fumes in that room are so thick even the oxygen molecules have great hair. But by 1985 standards, Dokken were both styling and profiling, and incidentally cranking out possibly the single most enduring collection of melodic metal ever burned to a piece of vinyl, so strap the fuck in, grab your bandana, because for the next hour we are rocking some docking. Oh, man, remember the opera singer? <laughs> <laughs> oh, these guys uh, pulled a horrible trick on this. Oh, she was an Italian girl, right? Yeah, opera uh, singer. Really beautiful. Uh, she was Gorgeous. an Italian opera singer. What really. you wanted to say, how do you do in American slang? Like, say, you know, how, you know, how you doing? Like a slang. I say, oh, you say, I am a swallower. And you say, what do you mean? And I say, you know, like a swallow. Like you say, I'm happy, like a bird who flies. Like a swallow. So she's walking around the going, going, hello, my name is Angie. She goes, I am a swallower. And they're going, really? Hello, I am so. I am a swallower. And, <laughs> and I love Don. I love Don. She kept saying, I love Don. I am a swallower. <laughs> In the tradition of the almighty Motorhead, 1981's Breaking the Chains is the album so nice they recorded it twice. Initially pressed by Career Records when the band was called Don Duck and tucked that little factoid away in the cerebral file of facts because once George Lynch starts his bitchin', that's gonna become profoundly fucking pertinent. This isn't a matter of two separate printings with a slightly altered mix, either. The two disparate versions of Breaking the Chains feature a different cover, different mix, different arrangements, different track order different band lineup, fuck, even a few different recordings. In case you haven't kept up with recent metal news, both Don and George are decidedly disputatious on the subject of how the inaugural effort came to be. We went to Europe and we had this sort of a record deal on a French label called Carrere in a publishing deal with uh, some German company. Oh, fantastic. That right. record sounded phenomenal, as, as dated as the material was, until it got you know, until we let go of it, basically, Don got a hold of it with... You know, and other just, people came in and just... Not other, just, you know, his ego got involved with the mix of it. Right. He, he sent us all home, and then he oh. stayed there and turned his vocals all the way up and squashed it, and it just sounded spineless and right, gutless right. and just wimpy, and I was just like, what the hell happened? I mean, it was it was ballsy at one point, at a one real old-school... You know, two tape, slam into yeah, tape yeah. way. It was cool. We talked to George, or I talked to George a month ago. He said specifically about breaking the chains that you stayed behind in your Germany or wherever Germany. you were and remastered yep. it behind their back. But I, I love it that he says behind his back. I guess George forgot that when we did break in the chains, he wasn't in the band. <laughs> when we did break in the chains, for the record... George, George, man, he's, he's got to get up. What are you smoking? He's guy's smoking something. When, George, when I did Break in the Chains, it was a solo record deal. George was not in the band. Mick wasn't in the band. Jeff, uh, J uh, Juan Crusier's pitch was on the album, but he didn't play on the record. Peter Baltus did, because Juan missed the deadline to get to Germany. 
I had Peter play the bass tracks. It was a solo album, and the album came out originally in Germany, and it was called Don Dokken Breaking the Chains. I have a copy. It's a picture of me in the cover, and it says Don Dokken. Now, George, I asked him to be in the band. He said no. I asked Mick if he wanted to be in the band. He said no. They were going to do something else. They are going to go back and do Exciter. So for him to say behind our back, he was paid $2,500 to play on the record, and that's it. He had nothing to do with Dokken. <laughs> he wasn't in the band. He just came to Germany. We did a little tour. I paid him. He left. He went back. He thought he was going to join Ozzy. That didn't work out. So he was basically had nowhere to go, no band, nothing. He was broke, and that's when he came back and said, I want to be in the band. Well, as per blabbermouth.net logic, clearly Don doesn't know what he's talking about, and George Lynch is a peerless exemplar of truth to- Liar! Nobody believes me, nobody believes me. Liar! Aside all the he said, he lied, I sincerely enjoy this album. Sonically speaking, it isn't at all emblematic of what most construe to be the classic Dawkins sound, but I would argue it's one of the more varied and unique releases in the history of 80s metal, with Don's soulful R&B-influenced crooning along with the more rhythmic, fung-inspired arrangements, Dawkins were able to carve an inimitable sound, drawing clearer inspirations to the likes of Deep Purple, Bad Company, or Trapeze, at a time when every new ALA hair metal mimeograph was preaching from the gospel according to Judas Priest. Certain songs, like one of my personal favorites, Felony, border on outright funk metal. Felony, what you did to me, the judge said sorry, first degree, how criminally underrated this song is, but the standout for most is a title track that was accompanied by what may well be the Rosetta Stone of unbridled 80s dick cheese. I think, I think basically that video is the Shakespeare of rock video. Yeah. yeah. That's just on the surface. Yeah, really, underneath you get, you get into it. Chaucer, Bollet's, um, Chaucer, Bernays. You know, that director goes, I got my girlfriend and I want to put her in the video. I'm trying to get her going. And I'm like, oh, here we go. Here yeah. we go with the girlfriend. Well, we all had our girlfriends that wanted to be in it, you know, so all we needed was this guy trying to shove his girlfriend in, you know? So he shot her. We said no. So I'm breaking the chain of the lyrics because he shot her. We said, no, we don't want a girl from the goddamn video. We don't want any girl. Mike Bernstein's, Cliff goes, yeah. I don't want any girls in the video. So he does all the video, and all of a sudden, there's a split screen that shows up on our video, and I'm going, said she loves me, and she looks on this girl's face going, she loves me. <laughs> She'll come back. And she's I'm like, a swallower. I'll come back. I'm a swallow up. <laughs> and I'm like, who's that girl? Where'd the girl come from? And he was like, well, it's the director's girlfriend. He did rock and roll high school. I tried to get Oh, man. And I'm like, I don't want her. It was too late. Then I saw the video, and I thought about quitting. Whatever your opinion of the mix, the songs are top-notch, the playing was impressive, and the crybaby cunt flaps whining about Don's voice being too soft are setting an Olympic distance record from the fucking point. That's the appeal, dipshit. There were a million hair bands with prodigy guitar players. Rat, Winger, Ozzy, Striper, throw a fucking dart. Name one other that had a vocalist stylistically evoking the likes of Paul Rogers, Michael Jackson, Stevie Wonder, or Glenn Hughes. Go ahead, I'll wait. It's what I thought, bitch. Buy it. I was watching MTV. Yes, I on MTV, and I watch MTV, and one of the other VJs, it wasn't me, okay, they were saying something about when your film just got lucky about a volcano exploding. And we want to get an eyewitness report from a person who was actually, actually there. Could you tell us, uh, Mr. Doc? Well, I was staying there in Hawaii. We were on tour with uh, Ronnie James Dio, and we sent George out to do this, the, the volcano was erupting, so they said you can't go up there. So well, whenever anybody tells we can't do something, automatically you know we go out and do it anyway. And this is the spirit of rock and roll. Right so here. we whipped up there, got a helicopter, put him on the volcano, we said, don't worry, George, it's safe. <laughs> so he's playing away, and all of a sudden this stuff starts shooting out everywhere, and he goes, hey man, my shoes are melting, I gotta get out of here. So we, he booked it in the helicopter, and we took him out of there. the chains for whatever classic status has been imbued with subsequently did jack with a side of fuck all upon its initial release and so after a successful world tour doc and were smacked with inexplicable crippling debt and you know we got a tour and it was exciting and went on tour with blush to cult and played arenas came home and he said yeah it was really great yeah i sold a hundred thousand records you only owe the record company half a million bucks 
Half a million bucks? We owe a half a million bucks? And so for three years, Doc and hibernated while George Lynch was officially hired to replace Randy Rhodes in Ozzy Osbourne for three entire days. Oh, but we'll get to that saga. With George having lynched his Aussie prospects, I make absolutely no apologies for that pun, by the way. The band had one final chance. Perhaps the purest distillation of the make or break album arrived in 1984 with the appropriately titled Tooth and Nail. Not, of course, to be confused with a record label that launched a thousand Zayo clones. Here I just done an arena tour for three months and we were absolutely, not only were we broke, we were massively in debt. And so the record company said, we don't like the band, they're not going anywhere, we gave them a push, it's over. And that's where it came up with the title, Tooth and Nail. I said, come on, just give us one more chance. The band were all the fuck in, George honing his guitar chops to a fuck you Ozzy Osbourne sheen, and Don Dockin shacking up with a vocal coach that helped him fully realize his potential power in the upper range. The end result was the darkest, heaviest, most addictive collection of songs in the band's catalog to that point, one that routinely features on best of the 80s lists to this day. Oh, but the conversation piece at the center of this buffet of badass is unquestionably the infectious Into the Fire, one that those with a keen ear will notice sounds suspiciously familiar to a song by the subjects of Metal Mythos number one, the legendary Judas Priest. History of Into the Fire, the other great greatest hits of uh, uh, Don Dokken of Dokken. Um, What's the history of that song? Into the Fire. Well, that was basically me ripping off a Judas Priest song. Heads are gonna roll. You know that song? <laughs> yeah, I ripped it off. to crane your neck a bit to hear it, but beneath all the chugs, aquanet, and reverb, I can definitely hear it. Guitar snobs often scoff at tooth and nail, largely due to the absence of what today is recognized as the signature George Lynch guitar tone, but fuck that noise. I really dig how Lynch's guitar cuts through like a chainsaw. It's not as rich or full as it would later become, but it sounds like a motherfucking chainsaw, and that, my fellow rageaholics, is metal! The unique R&B and funk affectations of Breaking the Chains may have drawn me into the Dokken dynasty, but what is it until I threw tooth and nail on the stereo, while doing my inaugural playthrough of Fallout 3 as it happens, that I officially became a fan, and before you scoff at the idea of the Neo-50s wasteland of Fallout 3 being scored by Don fucking Dokken, don't knock it till you tried it. For some reason, it fucking fits. Dawkins had doubled down and walked away with a watershed. Supremely recommended. The last couple of years have seen a number of talented new bands emerge from the local LA scene. More famous examples would be Motley Crue, Rat, and now Dokken. Here visit visiting us for the first time in the studios is Jeff Pearson, who's the bassist, and guitarist George Lynch. Hello. Hello, Hello Amanda. Welcome. Well, thank you. Where's young Don Dokken then? He's in Hamburg uh, with uh, a young lady, a, a Fraulein. Oh, he's not working then. Oh, he's working on so. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, what about all these ugly rumors I've been hearing that you lot don't get on? Oh, me and Don, yeah, and all get of along you. Great. Oh no, we're like we're like we're like uh, one big happy family. Yeah, we're fraternity you? brothers at happy hour. You got a knife in your heart, but don't say that you did it. Every band's discography, there is a cornerstone, an apotheosis of metallic might against which all further efforts are ultimately judged. For Dokken, that album is under lock and key, having emerged from their starving artist stupor on the strength of Tooth and Nail and its three Billboard hits, the follow-up plunged deeper still in every musical direction the band had explored on the previous effort. Too heavy for diehard metalheads to excoriate as pallid poser puff, and with enough melodic hooks to placate even the most flippant of pop sensibilities, it proved to be a potent blend that catapulted Doc into its very first taste of Top 40 success, and it also happens to be my personal favorite. And as easily as I could 
recite bone-crunching fare like Lightning Strikes Again or Unchain the Night, it's in the band's more evocative atmospheric moments in the latter half of the album that Doc and truly ascend to the cosmos. Case in point, my personal favorite, the post-apocalyptic nuclear anthem, Will the Sunrise. All the cogs of the Dokken machine were turning in the same direction on this album. Don's vocals were equal parts power and soul. The vocal harmonies provoke comparisons to titans of rock and heavy metal like the almighty mythos luminaries Queen. Mick Brown's percussion thundered through the mix like fucking mortar ordnance, and a George Lynch guitar tone that stands utterly unmatched among the Dokken or Lynch mob catalogs. <laughs> This album is perfection. Even a couple saccharine ballads like Jaded Heart and Slippin' Away are saved by the songwriting and atmospherics. If you want a place to begin rockin' with Dokken, this album. Right the fuck here. Don't think, just do it. Next. Hi, I'm Don Dokken. And I'm Jeff Pilson. And we've got a new song. In fact, it's the title track to Nightmare on Elm Street 3. It's called Dream Warriors, and Freddie said if we came by, he'd play it for us. But as you can see... <laughs> As you can see, I fucked up. So. <laughs> 1987's Back for the Attack is the sound of Dokken becoming softer and heavier, motherfucking simultaneously, likely owing to the fact that by this point, the members of Dokken wouldn't have pissed on each other to extinguish a fire. One half wants to be more melodic, the other half wants to be full-blown metal. Fuck it, know them both. In the process, refining their amorphous style into a painstakingly polished hybrid of melody and fury that if it had lasted just one more album, likely would have handed Doc in the late 80s, early 90s pop metal crown that would ultimately fall on the shoulders of bands like Skid Row and Firehouse. And for those purporting that Doc and are little more than hairband fluff, back for the attack is a punch square in your fully engorged cunts. Stop and ponder for a moment that Iron Maiden whose lead singer Bruce Dickinson was close friends with Freddie Mercury, wrote just one single line alluding to the AIDS epidemic on the Fear of the Dark album following his friend's passing in 91. Don Dokken, who legions of frothing maiden fan fucks and crusty battle jackets construed to be poser glam metal, opened this album with an entire song about AIDS in 87. Tried to stop that she held out of hell. Thrash metal bands, members of a subgenre that ostensibly is a pipeline directly from the goddamn gutter, wasn't opining on the subject of AIDS yet. Dokken, the band they're all chortling at in self-congratulatory glee because Zong Eyeliner has deeper lyrical content than they do. In 87, hell, Queen weren't even writing about it yet, and they had a band member who was dying from it. But it wasn't all socially conscious compositions, as the albums and the band's most infamous track, the immortal cut from the soundtrack of Nightmare on Elm Street Part three would prove, bitch, you know I'm talking about some dream warriors. I was so high during the making of that video, I couldn't bust through the wall. Because there's a point in my guitar solo where I'm supposed to just come crashing through this wall. Yeah. But I was, and that the wall is called a breakaway wall. It's, it's made so that it looks like a real wall, but like, uh, uh, you know, a fly could break through it, you know, an infant could break through it. But I was so high and so weak, I couldn't even break through it. I, and I had to keep resetting up the wall and reshooting it because I couldn't freaking get through it. And I thought, oh, Lynch is buff. He'll get through that thing. No problem. I can't. Wow. <laughs> Which is why in the video, if you watch it, I'm laughing. George is higher than his own opinion of himself? Well, who could have possibly given it? Freddy. And uh, he had the, the gloves with the blades on him. And uh, we were doing coke. So he's using his... his his blade fingers to serve up coke to everybody, <laughs> chopping it up with the, with the you know knife hand thing. It was, and you know, 
it was yeah, it's kind of surreal. That's right. Dawkins snorted blow off of Freddy Krueger's claws. Pack it in, motherfucker. You will never be more metal than this band right here. Back for the attack is uncut China White Dawkins straight off the boat from Bogota. On the subsequent tour for which audiences were treated to a band at its peerless peak. All cylinders firing the fuck off at once. And hey, blabbermouth, take a break from penning your Alexi from Children of Bodom rape fiction and consider that this poser metal band was on Monsters of Rock 88 doing shows every night with the likes of Metallica and Van Halen and absolutely standing their ground. On January 27th, 1988, LA Mayor Tom Bradley declared it officially Dokken Day and handed the band the keys to the city. Dokken were one album away from a headlining tour and ascending to the hallowed halls of bona fide rock royalty. And just as soon as it came, it was gone, daddy, gone. Well, Walk Away was, the bummer about the video was, I mean, it's, if you look at the video carefully and know where we're coming from, you analyze it, there's only one shot in the whole video where the four of us are in the same frame. And that's the helicopter coming in, you know, and the flames are going up in the, in the temple thing and we're playing because they actually shot, you know, Mick shot his separately, George shot his separately, Jeff shot his separately, and I show up the next day for the master shot <coughs> because we're, in a, you know, we're breaking up. We're all, you know, everybody's like, I hate you, I hate you more, and no, I hate you more, and it was, it was bad. We're filming a video for this live album, one studio track, and we had broken up, the band was already broken up, we're in a lawsuit, it was, it was bad, it was bad times, and so we had to show up and go, with one final album, a superb live record entitled Beast from the East, over and done with, and the entire band rolling on coke and endeavoring daily to replace their excellent vocalist with a generic Jeff Scott Soto sounding jag off, Don Dockin was hit with a comically lucrative offer from Geffen Records for a solo contract. Let's see. Stay with a band who only have careers because of the contract you scored for them, but who nevertheless conspire nightly to replace you, or hire four other superlative musicians and prove once and for all that George Lynch isn't the source of the Dockin sound. Decisions to fucking decisions. That's when Don Dawkins stole our music. <laughs> and uh, then he called me himself. and said, I stole your music and got a, a record deal. He asked us first, can I take these songs? We go, no. And he did. And uh, he sold them for $35,000. And, you know, and, and we got together with Don. Are you serious? Really? Yeah, this is the real story. Oh, we don't like know. airing any of our dirty laundry, by the way. So that's well, listen, you know, Don Dawkins was our first choice to play. We, we, we would never ask him to play in the band. Yeah, we like he Lisa stole first. our music, got a record deal, and we and I, and he called me to be the drummer. And I said, I'm not going nowhere without George. And I looked at George and said, that motherfucker stole our music. He's in Germany now. <laughs> so and he said, he said, get me out of this band. I don't yeah, want to George. And only Ro Logan Ro 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 is by himself. <laughs> is that what he said? It seems like all the problems go back to break of the chains. George and Mick claim one thing, Don claims another, neither are detached or for that matter sober enough to accurately recall in any event. If only we had a neutral third party to set the record straight. Someone like, uh, I don't know, the world famous record producer that made the fucking album? Breaking the chains, we Don and I. Uh, when I went back to Germany, Don came over and we uh, did a demo which later on turned into breaking the chains. Uh, in fact, um, Gabi Hoffman, uh, Wolf Hoffman's wife in Accept, uh, she took the demo and sold it. That's pre-George Lynch, right? That's pretty much pre-everybody. And uh, no, George Lynch wasn't even in the band. Half the people on the cover are not in the band. Uh, and people that were in the band are not on the cover. <laughs> it's very <laughs> confusing. But it was all, the songs were all written by Don Dawkin and uh, some of them are written by Juan Crucier. Grab the fucking ponchos, Lynch fan fucks. The first three rows may get wet. Let's just get this out there. George Lynch? hates Don Dokken, and vice the fuck versa. But according to both participants, the impetus of this feud isn't quite as banal as the traditional musical divorce. When we were together, there was this concerted effort on the part of the record company publicist to promote this infighting angle of the band. Really? Why? That was by design. Uh, because, uh, according to the publicist, she were, they were very frustrated because we didn't have a hook. We didn't have anything to really for them to latch on to to talk about um they needed something you so know they, we didn't have anything image wise or 
habit wise or you know, we're just a band. Whatever the record company's intentions at a certain point, life began to imitate the fine art of marketeering bullshit. So let's say this up front. Despite whatever I have said or will say to the contrary, I love George Lynch. He's probably my favorite guitarist on this planet. A statement I make with every awareness considering episode number two of this series was devoted to Yngwie Malmsteen. This man may well be second only to Eddie Van Halen in terms of unfettered 80s metal guitar innovation. His inimitable fusion of the neoclassic precision of Malmsteen, with desert blues and a generous slathering of Hendrix, made for some of the most balls-out blues metal you're ever likely to locate. He was nearly Ozzy's guitarist on three separate occasions, going head-to-head -head with Randy Rhodes and Jake E. Lee, and all three times, in my opinion, it was a mistake to pass him over. I've always considered it a bit of a shame that Ozzy didn't give George Lynch a call when he replaced Jake E. Lee, because fuck that Gimli-looking pinch harmonic princess, Zach fucking Wild, throwing eggs at Iron Man maiden during Ozfest. Blow me, you talentless butthole stinking biker bear. So why the schism? George claims it's ego. Don claims it's ego. Each points the finger at the other. But here's the thing. In doing my legwork for this mythos, literally pouring over metric cockloads of interviews, almost a hundred in all, across all epochs of Dokken lore, I have scarcely found an interview where Don Dokken doesn't put over George Lynch's guitar skills. The band, I thought he's a great <coughs> guitar player. He's fantastic. He's a genius. He's got, he's incredible. You know, in my opinion, coming from the L.A. Hollywood scene, mm -hmm. you know, I saw Randy Rhodes break out and go to Ozzy. I saw it, Van Halen come out in 78 with the mm -hmm. new first album. You know, Doc can play with Van Halen in 77 and 8 and 9. And I played with Quiet Riot in those days. And uh, to me, when I saw George, when he was playing with Mick and the boys, I felt like George was kind of heir to the throne after Eddie. You right. know? He's a really great guitar player. He is. And a very unique jack, I call it the jack off by Brado he does, you know. Including at least one from 84 where he puts over George to his fucking face in front of an audience in 1984 who probably didn't know the name George fucking Lynch by that point. And lastly. And the man himself, Mr. George Lynch. George, we welcome you. Thank you. Gather, gather around a little bit here. And this is during the period when George claims Don hated that he was being upstaged. I'll tell you what bothered me. Uh, can right. I get an answer for you? Yeah, sure. When you would announce the band every night, right. and when you said my name was twice as loud as when you said your name, that bothered you. Well, fuck Georgie Porgy. It's curious tactics to call further attention to the man you reputedly believe is stealing your goddamn spotlight, ain't it? Conversely, in dozens of interviews with George Lynch, I have yet to hear him compliment Don Dawkins' voice, even once. I got like 50 George Lynch interviews sitting on my computer right now, not one kind word. Fuck, I've complimented Movie Bob more times by accident than George Lynch has his own singer when he was in the same fucking band. Moreover, I've found multiple occasions where he outright takes shots at the man. Michael Sweet does not seem like the guy I would always associate with George Lynch. Stylistically, I think he's um, kind of in the same ballpark as the singer I had in the band when I was in the 80s, you know, Stockton. Mm -hmm. uh, much better, I, I feel. Never let the worst guy in the band be, have the band named after him. Listen, Lynchy boy, if you think Don Dockin circa 1987 was inferior to that fish-lipped Axl Rose wannabe you bailed out of the drunk tank at Bar Band Junction to wail obnoxiously over the first lynch mob record, you may well have invented a new phylum of uniquely goddamn delusional. You had one of the greatest frontmen in the history of rock. Give credit where it's due, you spray-tanned Easter Island statue. Yeah, sure, Don's the problem. Not the steroidal quintagenarian with facial skin the texture of an old basketball choking the lead singer out backstage Benoit style and all but openly admitting in publicly available interviews, might I add, that he released an entire album for the express purpose of killing his own goddamn meal ticket. Sure, let him back in the band. Show him the secret handshake. Hand the pyromaniac the tinderbox while you're at it. Don Dockin, you should let George Lynch back in the band at the precise moment that he can go a single fucking interview without talking shit about you. I want to get into um, TNN because... Uh... You decided to take back your music. <laughs> TNN is is uh, Jeff Pilson, Mick Brown, and myself from Dokken. Uh, Without Dawn, originally, uh, the working title of the record was Dump the Chump. When five interviews have elapsed without that chrome magnet control freak flapping his leathery jowls about you, I say give it a whirl. But until such time, 
don't waste yours. You got a guitarist that's like him, only still good, a bitchin' ass bassist whose iron lungs have cut some of the finest Yngwie Malmsteen records in existence, and ever since that vocal surgery, your own voice is gradually regaining its former strength. Until he can shut up for five adjacent minutes, the only reason you should hear the name Lynch is when it's preceded by the name Meryl and there's a distractingly well-hung bull dragging its dick across the screen. Next! Yeah, the most important questions of all today for me is uh, what's going to happen with the Dokken now? Well, uh, uh, the band hasn't really disbanded, but uh, technically, but we're going to do different projects. Mm -hmm. And uh, Don's got uh, some players from Black and Blue mm -hmm. together that he's playing with, and uh, I think he's written some things with John Norm. Now, when I say Don Dokken hired four superlative musicians to fill out the new lineup, Denise Richards' pepperoni nipples, did I ever goddamn mean it. A relative unknown, blues-oriented up-and-comer by the name of Billy White, bass guitar legend and superb vocalist in his own right, Peter Baltus, of one of my very favorite bands and doubtless the subject of a future mythos, except guitar legend and architect of the hair metal monolith that is Europe, none other than John Norum, and last but certainly not least, a percussive demigod who should be immediately familiar to the metal mythos faithful as the drummer of the almighty motorhead, Mickey D. This ain't even a band, folks. Paint Mickey D green, give him a Dracula cape and some Buccaneer boots, and it's a fucking Justice League lineup. Despite the fact that 1990's shockingly good Up From The Ashes album was always intended as a Dokken album, it would ultimately materialize under the title of Don Dokken after the other three members sued him for use of the Dokken name, making this the Dokken album that never was. And for the knuckle dragon dipshits soiling their dungarees at the very suggestion that Dokken continued after George's departure following Beast from the East first off, George wound up recording two more albums with Dokken after this, so close your fucking cunt flap already. And second, if the last 20 years have proven anything, it's that George Lynch, while important in his own right, was really only one quarter of what made the band work. Cranking the awkward dial up to 11, Dokken were up for a Grammy in 1990, meaning a band that were broken the fuck up had to tolerate each other for one night only so they could have the privilege of watching Metallica win because to the wizened old fuckwits at the Grammys, it's the medal award, and by God, the band with the word medal in the name is going to win regardless. Any reservations as to the legitimacy of this as a Dokken release were positively dwarfed by the Patagonian opening track, Crash and Burn, and the three remaining molecules of doubt were seared the fuck off the face of this planet by the closing standout, Down in Flames. No George, no Jeff, no Mick, Still fucking Dokken. Who's the source of that classic Dokken sound again? Metalsucks.net? Certainly sounds a fuck of a lot more like Dokken than Lynch Mob fucking does, don't it? Which isn't to say that Up From The Ashes rests on its sonic laurels. This album progresses in a decidedly more melodic direction from Back For The Attack, blurring the lines between rocker and ballad with rich and dynamic compositions that begin with a whisper before erupting into a bang, an approach perhaps no better exemplified than on my favorite track, The Haunting 1000 Miles Away, a song that opens with a Don Dokken piano piano solo in the tradition of Queen, only to tear into an immense chorus detailing the heartbreak of a long-distance love affair. With its unabashed focus on melody over metallics, it took me some time to warm up to this album, but upon further review, this is the fifth classic Dokken record. A stunningly excellent album that improves with repeated listens. Don't believe the fuckwads on Metal Archives, I would put up from the ashes against anything in the Dokken catalog. Next! I was to wear my new uh, outfit on stage, but all the girls in this club have my outfit. They stole my outfit. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
sadly, the Don Dokken experiment was not to last, with John Norum pursuing further solo work with Glenn Hughes on the supremely recommended Face the Truth album, Peter Baltus hooking up with the newly reformed Accept and Mickey D being gobbled up by Motorhead, Jeff Mick and Don came to terms, reconciled, and promptly began writing a new Dokken release, originally supposed to be his second solo project. But what a fucking Dokken release it turned out to be. One of the most consistently, and for music historians, somewhat conveniently overlooked facts of the narcoleptic 90s is that grunge didn't completely kill off metal. And for those of you thinking I'm about to repeatedly cite extreme metal or the trite triumvirate of Metallica, Megadeth, and Pantera, well, think the fuck again. Because even the hair metal side didn't completely disintegrate. Hell, Nirvana was knocked off the top of the charts by Def fucking Leopard. Nirvana was an artist of the year in 1992, along with the paragons of overrated Alice in Chains, they were actually passed over for fucking Firehouse, bitch! And in 1995, during the deepest doldrums of the post-suicide Kurt Cobain lovin', when the entire planet were glorifying a cowardly fucking heroin addict who abandoned his wife and newborn child because he wrote vapid three-chord radio rock, Dawkins' new record, Dysfunctional, nearly hit the top 40, 47 to be exact, Act, higher actually than Tooth and Nail, with no music videos, no MTV support, and flat zero radio play. It sold 400,000 copies in like the first eight weeks. Wow. And then unfortunately, the label decided, Columbia decided they didn't want to do rock. They wanted to concentrate on R&B and rap and blues, so they got dropped. So they just threw in the towel and never even did a video. It was a shame. It was a wasted record. And it was all down to the songwriting. By the time Lynch Mob had hit a hiatus and George was brought into the mix to put his own spin on the songs, the album had effectively been written, drawing heavily from their original 60s and 70s rock inspirations. The writing team of Don, Jeff, and Mick arrived at a folksier, bluesier, more soulful sound with frequent nods to their 80s past. <laughs> The end result is a second look masterpiece, one regarded by the Dokken faithful as one of their very best. If you like a little Beatles in your metal, fucking go for it. Whenever some bitch titty blabbermouth.net beluga hits you with the age old Don Dawkins ego is what killed the band yarn, should you feel the need or inclination, you can sink that George Lynch fanboy party yacht with all the two words. Shadow Life. Written almost entirely by George Lynch, this album may be the single most depraved chapter in the protracted radio rock ass ramming of the late 90s. A discordant conglomeration of every three chord, backwards hat, flannel bedecked, remind me to mail a thank you card to fucking Winchester alternative rock cliche that positively wallpapered the latter half of the 1990s. Shadow Life is without question the worst docking record, and one that George Lynch has long been rumored, according to everyone from studio engineer to Don Dokken himself to have purposefully engineered to suck new and exciting appendages for the singular purpose of ending a band he didn't form to fucking begin with. And true to its purpose, this album feverishly devours cock. It's two-fists in them like Ultimate Warrior on the turnbuckles, morose, uninspired, and beyond superfluous, whereas the preceding effort, Dysfunctional, flirted with the 90s while retaining the band's essential dockendom, Shadow Life is a cynical cash grab for radio playability in an era where the radio was uniquely goddamn unlistenable. What lifts my ass off the can to this day is that while hair metal is traditionally portrayed as commercially-minded fluff scientifically engineered for mass radio, Radio consumption grunge, which formed the blueprint for modern yarling radio rock like Nickelback and Seether, is seen as an artistically earnest endeavor that chased away the big bad 80s with their wild parties, loose morals, and actual fucking songwriting. Nirvana came through the door and just blew them open and uh, put hair metal to rest where it belonged. Nirvana's landmark, never mind, ushered out 80s excess with one swift stomp on the distortion pedal. <laughs> Grunge was proof positive that substance and sales could coexist. I experienced the backlash of being a sort of a semi-glam LA metal band. We did a show and the club was insane. There was people spitting at us. 
I mean, raining it down on us the whole show. And I, I looked over at Jeff for a second, and he had opened his mouth to go up to the mic to sing, you know, Just Got Lucky or some song. And I just saw a big loogie go right down his throat. We had to take him to the hospital, give him a tetanus shot. Oh. You know, Grunge, gather around the Cosby recliner for a roofie colada and a chat. Maybe bring your baby brother Indy along for the ride, because you both need to hear this. For an iconoclastic musical insurgence that breaks wind at the merest suggestion of accruing mass acceptance, the 90s grunge rock scene sure as shit was filled with the rafters with bands doing exactly goddamn that. And so is Indy. And Shadow Life is the pimple on their figurative asshole. How do you even pick a worse track here? What's the anal avalanches rolling on down Coprophagia Canyon out of the listener's oblivious skulls? Who gives a fuck what lone turd touched it off to begin with? I mean, I'm throwing a dart at random here. Just behold this fucking bullshit. I was lost without you. I mean, we got the patented CB radio for the love of God, someone murder system of a down vocal effect. We got the arbitrarily downtuned guitars, obnoxiously percussive corn bass. Fuck, throw in a peasant blouse and a Jennifer Aniston haircut, and this may be the single most 1990s thing in all of Christendom. Not even the classic Doc and logo can bring itself to be associated with this pile of chundering dicks. Shadow Life is a tireless typhoon of tripe. Go away, 90s. Go the fuck away. <laughs> this is uh, Reb Beach. The this is Reb Beach. Hi. Formerly from Winger. And then that's the Winger. 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 Alice Cooper. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's who I was with before I joined these wonderful people. How about this sunlight? Uh, yes, it's Every sunlight. Every day, the same thing. The damn the sun. The same. No. Every day. <laughs> In, then the night, then the sun. I don't know. With smoldering rubble where Dokken and let's face it, the entire music industry once stood, and George Lynch off chomping granola in the mountains of fucking Colorado with the ghost of Dan Fogelberg, the remaining three quarters of the man at last gave him his hiking papers. Sadly, if his mission was to deface and demean the Dokken brand, then mission resoundingly fucking accomplished, my friend. As such, the next album wouldn't be a follow-up to any of the previous material, but an outright reboot of the band itself, with the apropos nomenclature of your race the slate. But before they could take one step forward, they had to address the sunburned golem glowering in the corner of the room. Who indeed possessed the skill to fill the shredded khaki cargo pants of George fucking Lynch? At first it seemed former Don Dockin guitarist John Norum might be a fit, but when it came down to nut cutting time, he opted to continue his solo career instead, and so the call went out to the four corners of the globe, and who should proffer a reply, but perhaps the most underrated guitar gallant of the 1980s, winger and Alice Cooper's own, Reb Beach, whose faultless fretwork positively scorches through 12 tracks as some of the finest Dokken material committed to tape, such as one of my personal favorite all-time Dokken tunes, Change the World. <laughs> Which isn't to say Erase the Slate is a foolproof affair, as downbeat dog shit like Drown and Haunted Lullaby illustrate, the alternative rock affectations of the previous effort weren't yet completely shaken. After the aimless gutter grunge of Shadow Life, Erase the Slate bookended the 90s with aplomb, and along with a towering dysfunctional, definitively proved that Dawkins still had relevant music to make in the least metal decade in existence, ranking high in my personal pantheon in the process. Next. So long been Home is a curious record in that it starts off meandering maudlin and 
painfully 2002, and gradually improves from song to song so that by the time you hit insta-classics like Magic Road and Under the Gun, you'd almost be willing to say it stands shoulder to shoulder with Don Dawkins' first solo record. And let not the logo deceive you, Rageaholics, between Jeff Pilsen going Splitsville and the return of Up From The Ashes guitarist John Norum, Long Way Home is, for all intents and purposes, the second Don Dawkins solo effort. Presented within that context, it's a middling effort whose most inspired tracks are sadly countermanded by its opening volley of unrepentant mopery. Consequently, I can't go off the rails about how bad it is, because even the weaker tracks are at least listenable, and Don Dawkins' voice at this point was still very much in top form. But by attempting to contemporize their approach, it also resigns itself to falling back into the hackneyed haze of 2002. Look, when Audio Slave tries to sound like Audio Slave, they sound like fucking Audio Slave. Where Dokken with Europe's guitarist John Norum try to sound like Audio Slave, it just sounds every bit as gallingly insincere as it ultimately is. Dokken Ape and Audio Slave is like Pavarotti covering Britney Spears. Fucking quit it! Long Way Home is not abhorrent. It's occasionally exceptional, and the cover of the Yardbirds classic Heart Full of Soul, along with the entire latter half of the album, frankly, is a borderline must listen, but for the love of Lemmy, avail yourself of the omnipresent skip button. Next. We get Yngwie Malmsteen in the band. We last two shows. Yngwie's a great player, but we all know that he's a difficult person. I'm not know. playing with that asshole, no yeah. way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, he's a punk, you know, I mean, he just, he's just got his head up his ass. <laughs> The revolving door of Duck and guitarist spins eternal as halfway through the tour for Long Way Home, John Norum confused his hand with Joey Tempest's face and motherfucking annihilated it. And uh, so he did the album, and then unfortunately we were in the European tour, we got to Vienna, and uh, he smashed his hand. Uh. So right in the middle of the tour, we got a world tour, he, got, he made it about four months, he smashed his hand two cases. So here we are in Vienna, on our way to Paris, no guitar player. And we ended up having to bring someone in to fill in for him, you know, so he's finishing the tour out right now for us. A guy from Italy, Alex DeRosa. Acquiring a fill-in to cap off the remainder of the tour, somehow it had escaped Don Dawkins' notice that his lawyer also happened to be an amazing guitarist in his own right. Perhaps best known for his late 80s stint in the German metal Doropesh powerhouse that is Warlock. <laughs> John Levin's free swing and precision evoked the essential essence of George Lynch-era Dokken without resorting to outright imitation, at least not at first. That said, while its synthesis of both the old and new schools is considerably more effective than the feckless fusion featured on Long Way Home, I'd be lying if I listed 2004's Hell to Pay as one of the finer Dokken offerings. When Hell to Pay is on its game, rail me in a Fuck swing is it ever? As in the hands down best track, for example, a classic docking melody with a decumen dollop of modern groove metal that answers to the name of Better Off Before. Into your mind, as you will find that you were better off before. The sands of time have closed the door. You were better off before. All sunshine and roses is proven by some positively ludicrous tries for contemporary relevance that ultimately come off like Bob Costas and the Wu-Tang Clan. Hell to pay while showing initial promise and sporting some superb John Levin axe work is still a bit entrenched in the Knuckle Dragon 90s for my taste. Some great stuff on here, but still not quite the album Dokken needed to reestablish their melodic metal mastery. And speaking the fuck of which... And I gotta tell you, man, you, we were talking uh, over the course of the last year, and you were telling me about this blazing hard rockin' record that you have coming out. You want this new record to be able to live up to you know, anyone nail. watching Tooth and Nail under lock and key, back those attack. are the, you know, back for the attack are the iconic Dokken records, and that's yeah. the bar you've kind of set for yeah. yourself. I went back and revisited, and honestly, I don't listen to my records a lot because it's, it's like a painting, you paint it and then you move on. So I actually went back and revisited the records, and I asked John Levin, the guitar player, I said, you know, you grew up with Doc, and you like the way we wrote, now you're the guitar player in the band, you know, pick ten songs, favorite Dawkins songs. Forget about the hits, you know, I don't care about the, just pick your ten favorites. He burned me a CD, 
put it in my car, I just listened to it. And I hadn't heard these songs in like 15 years. And so I started listening to that stuff going, trying to put myself, where was I in that headspace? Trying to get myself what was what I was pulling right. the, the inspiration from. Right. And everybody, you look in the internet, everybody says, I can't believe these sound like they came from Tooth and Nail on the Punching Christ, what an album! There may be no more earnest, painstakingly performed, or appropriately thunderous comeback album in the last 15 years than Dawkins Lightning Strikes Again. And sadly, in a modern metal scene that has sung the praises of similar recent efforts by the likes of Judas Priest, or except, for whatever reason, for many metalheads, this album flew the fuck right under the radar. Well, those bitches have formally defaulted on their license to practice metal, as far as I'm concerned, because from the opening bars of the modern classic standing on the outside to the closing cacophony of this fire, Lightning Strikes Again motherfucking dominates, with particular attention paid to the jaw-dropping guitar heroics of John Levin, who at this point, it's time to admit, frankly plays George Lynch's style more effectively than George Lynch has in at least ten fucking years. <laughs> Deal with it. But more to the point, these original compositions simply curb check anything in the Lynch Mob catalog, or for that matter, any Dokken release since the dawn of the dog shit in the 90s. It's up from the ashes all over again, no Lynch in sight, yet every note is quintessential Dokken. Spread my wings and fly, nothing's left to me. I can't feel this love anymore. You turn to Heart of Stone. Well, that was John's title. I think he was writing about his ex. I so. think I was. Yeah, I think all your songs are about your ex. <laughs> hey, at least something came out of that, right? Yeah, besides all the money lost. Duncan's first release on a major label since 95 did not disappoint. I can put Lightning Strikes Again on after any classic Dokken release and walk the fuck away thoroughly satisfied. If you were sucked in by the classic force of a break in the chains, tooth and nail, under lock and key, and back for the attack, but have yet to add this sterling exemplar of melodic metaldom to your collection, remedy that post-fucking haste. Modern masterpiece. But just as the modern incarnation of Dokken were hitting their stride, the reunion rumors began to swirl once more. Why, the original lineup even briefly reunited on stage for a 2010 episode of VH1 Classics That Metal Show. And fell apart so fast you would have thought it was a George Lynch side project. And speaking of fucking which... George called me up and asked if I'd like to write with him for a Lynch Mob record. And when it came time to actually become a Lynch Mob record, things kind of fell apart. So it was Brian Tishy who suggested, well, why not take these songs, which he had played on, and do a record of original stuff with the stuff we've been writing, and then why don't you do some docking songs too, and call it Tooth and Nail, and get Mick Brown to play drums. So we did. the acrimony espoused in the aftermath by George Lynch, rather hilariously, the reasons for the 2011 reunion falling apart aren't even a matter of debate. Jeff Pilsen has a stable, eminently profitable gig in Foreigner and couldn't get the time off. Period. Explanation over. Even if you don't believe Don when he says it, Jeff cops to it himself. Do you personally foresee that there will be a dock and reunion of the classic lineup at all? Uh... Well, I would hesitate to rule it out, only because, you know, here we are 30 years later still even talking about it. So I would really never want to completely rule it out. But having said that, I don't see where it could happen anytime too terribly soon, mostly because of scheduling. And yet every time he's posed the question, George Lynch breaks out the tap shoes and it's time for the same tired song and dance. <laughs> <laughs> 
That metal show, you and Donk, a year or two ago, um, talking about a docking thing, um, didn't happen. Right. Reason. Besides Don Don's being kind of a... Uh, shit. All right, that'll work. There you go. That's the answer. Don wanted all the money. Don wanted all the money. Don wanted all the money. Bitch, I don't give a fuck if Don Dockin wanted to print the money. If Jeff can't do the reunion, then Jeff can't do the fucking reunion. Full stop. All you firing off that bitterness machine gun attached to that baseball mitt of a fucking face you have as accomplishing is ensuring that when the inevitable moment arrives that the clouds part and Jeff actually can do the reunion, it won't fucking happen because you were physically incapable of shutting your goddamn mouth. Oh, but the other three guys are still up for it. You know, the ones who outside of George Lynch, the average metalhead couldn't pick out of a fucking lineup. Enter TNN. Dokken without Dokken. I think you got something there, fellas. What's next? Powdered water? Your to the now it's time to in their face. Yes, Soundgarden called. They like their tribute singer back. Look, the originals are serviceable, but why is it 50-something-year-old men are somehow stubbornly convinced that employing the perma-flanging CB radio vocal distortion effect is still edgy in 2012? And how is it even physically possible to downtune Kiss of Death so much that not even the almighty Ripper Owens can salvage it from the mire of mediocrity? Oh, but George, now you've got your ideal version of Dokken. You noodling generic arrangements into oblivion, Mick punching a time clock, Jeff Pilsen sounding like a Las Vegas lounge singer doing show tunes. Why, surely this powerhouse will be sweeping the nation. So when's the tour, guys? What's the touring plan here? How are you going to address this on the road? Uh, are you going to, what's the band going to be when you tour? And if, and are you going to tour? We hope to for the next record. That's, that's the plan. Um, which we are going to do another record next year. Great. Can't wait to see it. Just don't lie to me. Don't treat me like a fool. It's almost as if Jeff Pilsen's schedule was the only thing precluding a 2011 Doc and reunion from happening or something. But that couldn't be the case after all. Don's the problem, right? 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 Fuck off, Manila Gorilla. We spent 11 months in this record. Since this is our last Doc and record, I'm not doing any more Doc and records. So I said, John, I want this to be our swan song, and I want to make a statement, and I want it to be as good or better than Tooth and Nail and Our Lock and Key, which is an impossible task, mm -hmm. but I'm going to give it our best shot. I stood alone and watched below as they burn their cities down. In contrast to the dense veneer of polish applied liberally to the top coat of Lightning Strikes Again, 2012's long-awaited follow-up was a more organic affair, evoking a slightly more muffled, full, live feel, standing in perfect counterpoint to its predecessors. Is Broken Bones as good as Lightning Strikes Again? I'm going with no on that one. From speaker-throttling speed metal anthems like Empire and Tonight to down-paced pop metal like Burning Tears, Broken Bones is supremely capable of emerging from the shadow of its predecessor, but the fact remains it's just a cunt hair away from being right on its level. But you have to frame this album within its appropriate historical context, namely the circumstances under which it was recorded. After over-touring, not to mention knocking back enough Jack and Cokes to float Jim Sterling's gravy boat, Don Dokken was in dire need of reparative vocal surgery, which which he underwent to the closing months of 2010. But it was a long road to recovery, and he didn't begin to see noticeable improvement until late 2013, when his long dormant falsetto gradually began to reemerge. <laughs> The bad news, Broken Bones was recorded before his voice started down the long winding road to recovery. To make matters worse, Don began undergoing retreatment for stomach cancer around the same time, leaving one of the finest voices in rock effectively reduced to a raspy bellow. The vibrato and bluesiness, however, which to my mind is the true selling point for Don's voice in the first fucking place, 
very much present and accounted for, and with some of the bluesiest compositions Dokken have ever recorded on offer, in a strange way, the gruff, raspy timber actually kind of works for a few of the songs. The title track immediately springs to mind to me. Fortunately, this gave the band an excuse to re-explore an element of their sound that lay dormant during the stripped-down 90s and 2000s, those rich vocal harmonies that sold the band to the public in the first place. Employing the services of a man who should be familiar to the mythos faithful from episode number two, perennial Ingve singer Mark fucking Bowles, who by the way is now Dawkins' permanent bassist, Broken Bones boasts wall to wall rich choral harmonies. But then you hit the middle of the record and it's time to fire up the filler. I like that chorus. Yeah, well, I hope you like it 25 fucking times in unremitting succession because that's exactly what you're goddamn getting. What are you taking songwriting lessons from Iron Maiden? It's a chorus, not a Gregorian chant. Say when already. It's weaker moments notwithstanding, Broken Bones is an excellent record, just not the ideal one to end a career on. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, record a new fucking record already. And with that, we close the modeled tome of Dokken, in my thoroughly immodest opinion, a band that deserves about 17 times the respect and recognition that their musical legacy warrants. Irrespective of the whirling firestorm of fractious band relationships, courtroom slugfests, backstage slugfests, and nearly three uninterrupted decades of he said, she said, nah uh yeah huh, verbal pot shots between band members in the eye of the harrowing hurricane is a stunning discography, rife with hooks most bands would commit murder to attain a band that stands equally as credible in their heavy metal roots as in their top 40 hit making. Hair metal? Fuck no, just one of the most sincere and talented bands in whatever configuration to grace the flagging music industry. I'm Razorfist, until we once more brave the mists of the metal mythos, keep rocking with Dokken, and God fucking speed. Why I'm stuck inside the maze? How many times has this happened to you? Got back from the rock show and want to spin the guitar around your neck? Well, now you too can be in the spotlight, posing like the stars, with the new Guitar Buddy Throw and Go Wraparound Guitar Trainer. Imagine yourself just like your favorite rock star. Order now and you'll get your free copy of Metal Poser. You'll learn windmills, spins, deep knee bends, heavy metal faces, and more. You'll also receive free the Guitar Buddy Whammy Neck. So don't delay. Order today. Send $49.95 to P.O. Box L-Y-N-C-H-P-I-L-S-O-N, L-A, California, 90000.